Any questions before we start? Actually, I do know that you have some questions. I can do a psychic reading. One of the, the, the first psychic reading of the class today is Have you started assessing assignment one? Right? Some of you are wondering about this. And the answer is. exciting weekend <laughs> and I think I got through about 20 of them which is not I was hoping to get through 35 but it didn't happen <laughs> it <looked, laughs> that would be a good risk analysis they look quite reasonable so far quite reasonable I thought that I, I got psychic waves about something else, but I, I've lost them again. Anyways, there was a question, a good question by Carlo last Friday on the marching squares algorithm. He said, is it possible to have four edge intersections? I think that was the question, something like that. So one of the nice things about marching squares and marching cubes, by the way, is you only need to look at one cell at a time to do the processing. This is one of the strategic advantages of, of, of that algorithm. So if I choose an ISO value of 5 and I process this square, in marching squares, I test this edge, I find out that there's an edge intersection, Right, because two fives between two and six, and then I mark my edge intersection. I perform the same test between three and six, and I discover that there's an edge intersection there. There's three and six again, right? So I discover that there's an intersection there, and I interpolate to get the position. And then same thing here. So this one is a little bit even a little bit closer, right? So I have four edge intersections. Now th there is a there is an ambiguity here. So I can assume that the surface passes through this way, but I can also assume that the surface passes through this way. Right? And so that is an ambiguity, it's an amb ambiguous case, and we're going to talk about ambiguous cases. But in one way to handle an ambiguous case like this is to subdivide the square and then interpolate the point in the middle right, to see which, what the sign of the point in the middle is. That will, that will decide. So for example, if, in this example, if, if the point in the middle is below, below 5, that means it's, it's inside the ISO surface. And if, if we want, if we want, 
we can draw these as inside the isosurface, and therefore the blue, the blue is what we're looking for, right? And the blue is correct. Otherwise, it's outside the isosurface, and the black is correct. Right? I don't know what the interpolated value is there, I'd have to work it out. And if there are any questions about marching squares, it's a good day to ask because I have the markers and the whiteboard, which I did not have on Friday. So we're going to go into marching cubes. And just a little, I guess, word of caution. This is the most difficult lecture so far of the module. And there will be even more difficult ones after this. I think everything has been pretty straightforward and easy up to today, as far as I can see. But today it gets a little bit more difficult. Is everybody nervous? Yes. <laughs> I think it's, I'm not, I, the reason I, I issue that warning is not to be a jerk, by the way. It's to actually get like to to get you to sit up and pay attention, because I, I remember being a student quite well, and sometimes you, I did fall asleep during lectures. Sometimes I, I did until I started bringing coffee to lectures. But sometimes the the lecture would just go right into a subject that was very very difficult and not, and I wouldn't know it was coming, you know. And, and, and I would get caught off guard and then just be completely lost. And I just, I do think it's nice to get a little warning actually, like, oh, I should pay attention, otherwise I could easily get lost. That's just my opinion. And I could tell stories about that, but. So we're going to talk about marching cubes. We talked last time about what an isosurface is, what an iso value is. And we went over the where we are on the volume visualization pipeline, right? For when we compute isosurfaces, there are some example isosurfaces, and then we talked about how to derive iso contours, which is the two D version of marching cubes. Now, how do you extend this idea to three D? That's the question. So in 3D, instead of storing the data on a square, we're storing it in a cube. So the idea is the surface cuts through the volume in each cell. And what we can do is we can actually process the entire volume on a per cell operation. This is one of the great things about the algorithm. Is you technically only need one cell in memory at the same time because data sets are always exceeding the size of available RAM. Right? It doesn't matter what's, how much RAM you have, I can always get a data set that exceeds that size. And this is, so this is a nice property of the, this is like, this is one of the properties that makes the algorithm so popular. It is a very popular algorithm. And that's why I'm going to talk about it. So look, this is a schematic of a cube, and that gray thing is a, is a surface passing through the cube, and, and ice, the ISO, the margin cubes algorithm has extracted the triangle that's inside the cube that approximates the surface. Right? And that's that's what it looks like. So that's the that's a little a little that's the idea approximating the isosurface using triangles. And here's a, an overview of the steps. So the steps are examine a cell, classify each vertex at the corner as either inside or outside, like below the iso value or above the iso value. Thank you very much. Everybody sign the attendance. This is, you know, this is easy, this is easy. 
build an index, that's also easy. What it's, how it's actually used is a, is a little bit non-trivial to understand. Get an edge list from a table. This is actually quite a tricky aspect, not so trivial to understand. Interpolate the edge location. That's not very difficult to understand, I would say. Six compute gradients, I would say yes, that is kind of difficult to understand. And consider, considering ambiguous cases, this can be not trivial. And go to the next cell is quite easy. So it's a mixture of easy and, and confusing steps. The first three, I think, are easy, but then it starts to get a little bit more complicated in the second half. So we, we can process the data one cell at a time. In the original paper, the March and Hughes paper from 1987, they read in one slice of data at a time, as opposed to one cell at a time, or, or actually two slices at a time. So if you have two slices of data, you get a full, full plane of cells at the same time. And you have to give each vertex some number or some index. Right? Here, we, in this representation, this is vertex 0, right? I, J, K. This is vertex 1, I plus 1, J, K. And this is vertex 2, I, I plus 1, J plus 1, K, and so on. So, in this example, the index starts here, index 0, it moves around in the, in the is that anti clockwise, anti clockwise fashion, if you will. And then it jumps up here and circulates in the, again in the anti-clockwise or counterclockwise fashion. And that that sounds trivial. It is trivial. There's nothing complicated about that. But you do have to agree because there are many, many different ways in which you could order the vertices. And the ordering of the vertices is, is important. But isn't that Geometry convention, you always have on the bottom left with your first and then you go kind of clockwise. <sighs> Did everybody hear Carlos' question? Isn't that the convention to start with the bottom? There, there is no universal convention of, for, for better or for worse for coordinate systems and computer graphics, like the OpenGL coordinate system and the Java coordinate system. Oh, I was talking about the geometry, but I remember in class they always told me. I wish there was some universal convention or universal standard, but because there isn't, it, it can you know cause cause complications. Yeah. So step two is to classify each voxel according to whether it lies inside or outside the surface. So here's a cell. And these are data values, like 8, 8, 8, 10, 5, 5, 10, 10. And if we choose an ISO value of 9, for example, or say an ISO surface of, that generates an ISO surface of 9, we look at each vertex and classify it as if it's inside or outside. So 10 is above 9, so we classify it as outside. It's, you know, that, that's, it just has to be on one or the other side, so to speak. 10, again, is above 9, so we classify it as being on the outside of the surface. 5 is below 9, so we classify it as being on the inside of the surface. So we're just comparing the data value stored in each vertex to the ISO value. Is it above or below? I, I forgot, oh, there's, there's this, other, this other condition, equal to. If it's equal to, then we classify it as, quote, inside. That doesn't really happen in practice very often with real data, but you have to cover that case. And the same, same goes for the other ones. If we change the ISO value, then those, the results of those tests are going to change, right? Some vertices might change their sign from inside to outside. So 10 is above or outside, above or outside, 5 is still below, 5 is still below. Did any of them change? Okay. This one is above. 
This one changed. This is the only one that changed. So now it's above, speeds above seven. So it's outside rather than inside. Everybody with me so far? If you have questions, just interrupt any time or, or you know, stop screaming. <laughs> Now, we use this convention to build an index. So, here are the vertices again. Vertex 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Here they are. Vertex, I said vertex 0 in the previous slide, or the previous two slides, but here it's starting with the number 1, 2, Look, it's, it's changed, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right, there's a vertex ordering. And then you store an index depending on whether the value stored at that vertex is inside or outside the ISO value. <coughs> so here's an example of vertex 1 is inside the ISO it's below the ISO value or inside the ISO surface. So a value of 1 is stored in that index. At vertex 2, it's the same thing. It's below, in this example, it's below the ISO value, below the ISO value. So wherever it's below, I'm sorry, it's this order. 1, 2, 3, 4. Sorry. 1, 2, 3, 4. Those bits correspond, those four bits correspond to these four data points. <coughs> They're all inside the isosurface in this example. This one's outside, so it gets a zero. This one's inside, it gets a one, and so on. So we build, we use that information to build an index, an 8-bit index. And I haven't said what the index is used for. Right now it's just a random 8-bit index. But it encodes the vertices, whether they're above or below the ISO value. They get whatever, they, whatever ISO value the user has chosen. Here's another one. So this is outside, 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 outside. So it should, it should oh sorry, it's outside, outside, inside, inside. Zero zero one one zero zero one one, and then outside 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 outside. So all zeros. Everybody follow that part. I you don't need to know what the index is used for. That's not until the next step, but just how to build the index. So now, now we can look at the combination there. It's an 8-bit string. So there are 256 different ways that that string can, there are 256 values that that string can encode. Right? And they correspond to 256 configurations of the cube depending on whether vertices lie inside or outside the surface. Now, those 256 cases of combinations of vertices that can lie inside or outside the isosurface can be reduced down to 15 unique base cases using rotational and reflection symmetry. So this is, this is the most common case, actually. Does anybody know what that corresponds to? This, this cube? Which case? Correct. It corresponds to all vertices either being above the ISO value or below the ISO value. It's the most common case. So in other words, the ISO surface does not intersect this cube. It doesn't pass through because all the data values are either above or below. And this, this thing can be rotated eight different ways, and it would achieve the same results. Right? One, 
you know, it can, it can be rotated in, in eight different, at least eight different ways and have the same results. So that's, that's what this statement means, that 256 cases can be derived, can be derived, and then there are only 15 base or unique cases. Here's a, the next simplest one. And this is when one vertex falls inside the surface. Only, only one. In this case, we know that there's an edge intersection here, here, and here. And we can connect those three intersections to form one triangle. If only, if only one falls below the isosurface, that means the rest of them fall above the isosurface. Right? So we get an edge intersection here, we get an edge intersection here, we get an edge intersection here. So one, two, three. And they're connected to form one triangle. One piece of the isosurface. And you can see that this can be rotated eight times and form the equivalent case. Right? If I rotate this thing 90 degrees that way, this, this vertex will move to this position. That's that symmetry, reflection and rotation symmetry I'm talking about. And all those faces are equivalent to each other because they all generate just one triangle in the isosurface. The next most complicated case is when two adjacent vertices fall below the isosurface or are on one side of the isosurface. So in this case, no pun intended, we have like one edge where there's an intersection, here's another edge where there's an intersection, there's no intersection along this edge, we have one intersection here and another intersection here. So we have four vertices. And using those four vertices, we generate two triangles that the isosurface is composed of. Now, we, I, I'm just telling you the results. This is like, this is showing the results. We haven't said actually how these triangles, like how those triangles are actually computed. We haven't mentioned that yet. I'm just saying this is what happens when you have this case. I haven't said how it happens yet. Here's another case, right, where we have two vertices on one side of the isosurface, the inside of this case, and they generate two, two triangles. It's very similar to this case, right, but it's adding one more. Very similar. And the, the, the complexity increases the more, the more, when we look at different configurations, like this one's a little bit complicated. It's, there are one, two, there's a vertex hiding behind there. Three vertices that are adjacent and below the isosurface there. And that results in three triangles. We can count the edge intersections. Here's an edge intersection, here's another one, here's another one, there's another one. So one, two, three, four, five. And so on. This is an easy one, right? Four adjacent vertices on the same side or below the isosurface. That means the other ones are above. And that means the isosurface passes straight through, just cuts it in half. Here's that case where, just, just like this one, actually, where there are two pieces of the surface. Right? There's a piece here due to these three vertices, and then there's another piece here. So it's, it's, it's passing through twice. And then look, at it, it can, in, the, in the 3D case, it gets more complicated, right? This is passing through one, two, three, four times. So we have four separate. It's very similar to this case, actually. We're just adding more disconnected vertices. 
use in, 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 in there the rest of the cases. We don't need to go through every case individually. We, but these are the 15 unique, also called base configurations of, of the way a, a surface can pass through a cube. So we know that the surface can only pass through the cube 256 different ways. That's, that's, the, that's the limit, so to speak. Because there are only 256 configurations for those vertices, whether they lie, whether they lie above or below the isosurface. Does that make sense, hopefully? I haven't said how yet that I was trying to derive. I've just said they are derived as part of the surface. The, the, the important takeaway here is that for a given index, we can access an array storing a list of edges, and those are edge intersections. So we can store, using that index, just say, okay, since we know that this first vertex is below the isosurface, we have edge intersections here, 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 always, period, and stored in a lookup table. So that's the idea. This is where it starts to get a little bit more difficult to understand. So given an index, this unique index, we know that it could corresponds to one of these configurations always. It, it, it corresponds to one of these always. That doesn't change. Because that's true, we can store all the configurations in a lookup table ahead of time before we run the program. The edge intersections don't change. So for a given index like this one, 101100001, which could look like this, right? That means we have four triangles. So whenever we have this index, it means the isosurface passing through this cube consists of four triangles, always. And we can store that information in, in the lookup table. So on the left side of the lookup table is the index, and on the right side of the lookup table is a list of triangles. For example, triangle one, two, three, four, and, in, and edges, edges and triangles. So the first triangle is the edge intersection of E4, E7, and E11. So there's edge 4, where's edge 7? There's edge 7, and where's edge 11? There. So there's a triangle that connects those three. That's our first triangle on the isosurface. Carlo? Uh, I have a question. Could you go to the previous slide? For yep. yep. For instance, in the second picture, uh, second row, first on the left, that is absolutely parallel to the plane that would contain four vertices, right? So it's not like the margin squares or even term plane, it's always going to be parallel, right? That is a good question. The reason it's shown like that is because we haven't included the interpolation yet. So once we add the interpolation step, this surface can slide up and down in the cube. So you will do interpolation? Yes, interpolation comes in like two steps or something like that. So but it could be oblique as well. It could be in any kind of, all right. That's right, that's right. So this one can sink down, and that one can rise up. That's right, that's right. We haven't gotten to the interpolation part yet. That's like the next step, I think, maybe in two steps. The first, the, the previous step to that is just identify the edges that the surface inter intersects and use those edges to form triangles. Right? Because in computer graphics, surfaces are composed of triangles, generally speaking. Right, this is this is the way the graphics cards work. Right? They, like, they like triangles. I actually don't remember the history of that, the reasoning behind that. It, it has something to do with the hardware, but it's before I guess it's before my time. I'm not really a computer graphics person, 
so to speak. So everybody see that? So given this index, we can we can store this edge intersection information in a lookup table ahead of time. So the second triangle is the intersection of E1, E7, and E4, wherever that is here. Right? So there's a triangle that spans E1, E7, and E4. And that triangle is always going to be there for this index. It's always it's stored ahead of time. This is in already stored in the lookup table. Triangle 3 is edge 1, edge 6, and edge 7. So that triangle right there. And then the last one is going to be E1, E10, and E6. So it's four triangles in this particular case for this particular index. It's just an example of given an index, what are the corresponding edge intersections and triangles, associated triangles. So the original authors had to work that out before they ran the algorithm. Right? They had to pre-compute all of this information and store it in a, in a lookup table as part of the Excuse me? <laughs> Actually what they did, they, they, they wrote a little piece of software, a little program that took the base cases and then rotated them all so to generate the base cases before they work out. That's right, that's right. So they take the base cases and then use rotational and reflection symmetry to get the all 256. So they didn't do it by hand. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, very clever. It's very clever. Step five, this is the interpolation part. So we now we know the, the triangle edge intersections and the triangles. But the position of those triangles needs to be updated using interpolation. For example, how close is, is this triangle supposed to be to its, to its corresponding vertex, right? So for each triangle edge, find the vertex locational edge using linear interpolation of the voxel values. Right? In this example, let's say t equals 5. So if this is if this is 10 and this is 0, then t equals 5 is going to be exactly halfway through. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't look like it's halfway through here but it, it would be halfway through, like 5 is half, roughly halfway through you know, 0 and 10. And then the same here, okay, that looks like halfway through, and this one looks like halfway through. But if, if t was 1, this thing would slide towards the, the non-vertex, so to speak, because the vertex is uh, still going on. In this example, it's 8. So using interpolation to find the edge intersection, it slides this way towards the 10, right? The value of 10 is being stored here. And this one slides down. And this one should slide forward towards the, the 10. Because 8 is close to 10. Right? Using the So on the other ones, we always see them like it's a flat kind of feature made of triangle, but after the relation, you can shift, like you go like that. Mm -hmm. So it's not broken up in the triangle as the part of the thing. Nothing's actually going to happen to the triangles, it's just their vertex. Their, that's the position of their vertices will slide along the edges of the cube. But nothing, nothing happens to the topology of the triangles. Like they don't get broken apart or anything like that. And you can kind of, you can see that here. All these, there are, there are one, two, three triangles connected to this one. So they all three of them get pushed together along the edge through interpolation. 
It's not like two movements split apart or something like that. Yeah, but if you look at it from the side, the while here it might look flat, it might actually be like, like broken up in the middle or something. Like there's still the edges are conserved. One side will grow up and the other down in a way. Yes, it won't get separated though. It won't get, it won't get broken up. But yes, it could like flip, could like, you know, somehow like, well, not flip entirely, but one, these could move up and like these could move down. I guess what I'm trying to say is that not all the triangles and the triangles will be on the same plane, as I said. Correct. That's correct, yeah. That's correct, yes. They could fold and bend. Yes, yes. Okay, that, that's, that's a little bit complicated. This is more difficult to understand. The next step, step six, calculate the normal at each cube vertex. Everybody know what a normal is? It's a strange, strange word, actually. I don't understand that, that they're, you know, like, what the et etymology of that word. Anybody know what a normal vector is? <clears throat> What's your name? Alistair. Alistair. Yeah. Uh, is it common difference to the tangent on the surface? Yes, how did you know that? I just kind of remember from, from graphics class? Uh, yeah. You have a very good memory. Yes, that's it. You, you just gave a textbook definition. It's the, it's the, ortho, uh, the vector that's orthogonal to the, the surface, or perpendicular to the tangent of the surface. I'm trying to be as confusing as possible, but that's, those are the textbook de that's the textbook definition. So it's it's the it's the the vector that's pointing away from the surface outwards. If it's a sphere, then the vector starts at the center of the sphere and points radially outwards. That's the the normal vector. Now this is saying calculate the normal vector at each cube vertex, but that doesn't make any sense really because. There's no surface at the at the the cube vertices. That's what makes this so confusing. Now, what before? Let's step step back though. Why would why are normal vectors a topic in computer graphics? Why are they such an important? Why is that term so important in computer graphics? Anybody remember? Alistair, do you happen to remember that one? What are, like, what are they used for, the normal vectors? Um, for intersection? Yes, uh, yes, very good memory. So, they're used to compute lighting and shading effects for surfaces. Right? In 3D, you want to have these, these effects of light sources and shadows to give it that 3D look so you can perceive you can give the illusion of depth, essentially. Now, <clears throat> this is a tricky difference between like, classical computer graphics and volume visualization. If you jump back in your time machine to computer graphics class, you had, as input, you always had a set of triangles or, or surfaces. That was the input to all of your algorithms. And you could either derive normal vectors from those triangles, or you could be given normal vectors for those triangles in which you would apply the shading, the light. It's like form shading is the, is the default shading in computer graphics, right? But that's not the situation in volume visualization. The input to all your volume visualization algorithms is volume data. It's this data stored at the vertices of cubes. There are no normal vectors, so to speak, because there are no surfaces. But now, we're trying to derive a surface using, it's called an isosurface, and we want to be able to apply shading to that surface to give it that nice you know, effect of, of shininess, lights, Shading, shading, form shading. So we're trying to derive surfaces from volume data. 
And therefore, we need or we want to derive normal vectors for those surfaces so that we can apply shading. And this is just a synthetic or this is a, an artificial but very good technique for deriving normal vectors that we can apply to the surface. And the normal vectors are derived from the data itself. That's kind of a long background explanation for this. But that's, that's all part of this amazing slide. <laughs> so how could you synthesize or just make up normal vectors for your surface? How could we do that? So the first step is to calculate the normal vector at each cube vertex. So these are, ver these are cube vertices and we're deriving very arbitrary normal vectors. They're not corresponding to any surface. But we're going to use them. We are going to get them to correspond to the surface. So how can you just generate random, what, but you don't want random. How can you generate normal vectors for vertices in a reasonable and systematic way that makes sense? And that's what this slide is trying to answer. Using central differences. So a normal vector in 3D has three components, an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. And this is how we generate the three components of the normal vector. We just use, we just use the, the data values and subtract them. So for example, if we want to generate the X components of the normal vector at this vertex, we just take the x component of the data, the, 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 the data here, if it's, a, if it's a 10, for example, and we subtract off the data stored along the x-axis, our x, x minus 1 neighbor here. So if it's 1, then we end up with a value of 9 here. So that's just an arbitrary way to generate the x component of the normal vector. We just take the value of our neighbors along in the x direction, and subtract their data values from each other. And then we suddenly have a reasonable x component of the normal vector. Same with y. So in the y direction, it's going to be subtracting this neighbor from this neighbor, the data values, to generate the y component of the normal vector here. And then for the z direction of the normal vector, we just take the rear neighbor. The data value is right on the front neighbor along Z. And we use that as our Z component of the normal vector there. We add those three, com the three components up, and then we have a normal vector for that vertex. <laughs> Did I lose everybody there? <clears throat> that's, a, that's a more difficult one to understand. Now that's the way to derive the normal vectors at the vertices, the cube vertices, but then we have to use linear interpolation to compute the, the polygon vertex normal. So we need a vertex normal stored here, here, and here. Right? And we linearly interpolate the x components, the y components. So to get this one, we interpolate the two vectors, these two vectors, at, at this position. And to get this one, we interpolate these two at this position. And to get this normal vector at this triangle, <coughs> into set our vertex, we interpolate these two. It's, kind of, it's a lot of computation to generate the vertex normals. And those are the normals you need to to define a normal vector for the surface so you can apply systematic shading and lighting to your surface in the classic computer graphics way. That's a complicated one. I guess, I guess that's the most complicated step out of the steps. Carlo, why are we making up a neighbor when the actual point has a neighbor? Like, apart from the one, every cube is going to have a neighboring cube, right? That's right, that's right. 
We're not making up a neighbor, we're using the actual neighbor. We're using the actual neighbor. We're well, using the actual neighbor. Arbitrary minus one. No, no. It, well, it, it, it's like subtracting one from the, you, the index that you're at. Oh, you know? Okay. Yeah. So this is x plus one. So imagine this is gx, right? The, the normal, the, the x component of, of this one. x plus one is over here. And then x minus one is over here. I'm just using that convention, right? It could be, you know, I'm just saying the x, that x axis is, is along the it's horizontal. So this. when you actually get to the end of the surface, then do you just get that as zero? <laughs> Carlo understands what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's, so what happens when you have no neighbor, if you're at the boundary, right? You have no neighbor at all. Anybody have answers? Yeah, so, so boundaries are always fun in computers. You just go to the other side. Yep, that's one of the solutions, is use the neighbor that's on the other side, so to speak, that wrap around the, the, the space. That's one solution. Any other ideas? Make an average of the neighbors. You could take some sort of an average, yes, that's possible. You could extrapolate, which we don't talk about in this module very much. But if you have a value here and a value here, you can predict the value here. You can guess what that value is going to be using extrapolation. And then use the extrapolated value. The simplest technique is just to repeat the value. So take this value and repeat it over here. So you add padding, a layer of padding on all sides, just duplicate, duplicating the, the boundary. Another solution is just to set the boundary to zero. I, I, I wouldn't choose that one, but that's, that's a, a possibility. But I, I think the simplest and easiest is reasonable is just to repeat the, the, the last thing, duplicate it. If somebody that wants to be fancy will use the extrapolation, use extrapolation too. But I have, there are visualization algorithms that, that wrap around, and computer graphics algorithms that wrap around the space and use the, the data from the other side, so to speak. So it forms one continuous space. Fun stuff, isn't it? <clears throat> then we have the ambiguous cases. Right? How do we handle ambiguous cases? Right? Those are ambiguous cases. Right? These are ambiguous cases in 3D. <laughs> the resolution is to choose the right case. But yeah, that, that's, look, look at this. These four vertices are the same on both cubes, but the surface passing through is different, and they're both theoretically correct. Same situation here. So what, what do you do about that? Right, this is, the, this is what can happen, right? If we, if we compute the wrong isosurface and then just join them, you can end up with a big crack in the middle. But here's a, 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 a continuous surface, right? And there's a, another configuration, another ambiguous configuration. So there are a few different ways to handle that. Like one, as this slide implies, by the way, one way of handling that is to look at your neighbors. You can look at your neighbors and find out, okay, am I gonna am I gonna form a continuous surface if I join if I look at my neighbors? Like that's a that's an option. Another option is like we mentioned before to just subdivide the cube and then interpolate the value at the middle to decide, okay, which case are we in? And another one is called the asymptotic decider, right? We assume that the surface is very similar to just subdividing. We assume that the surface can be appro approximated by two hyperbola, right? We compute the location of those, 
and then we test the points at this intersection point. We test the data value using interpolation at this data point, and we use the sign of that inside and outside to determine if it's if this is the correct approximation or not. So if we if we assume that the surface forms two hyperbola through the cube. And imagine this is on the inside and this is on the inside. If we compute, the, if we derive the interpolated value here and it falls on the inside, we've got the configuration wrong. We have to, we have to switch so that this is inside. We have to switch our configuration so that the hyperbola passes this way. In this example, if this is on the outside or the other side of these two quarters, the two hyperbolae are correct. It's all about comparing the sign of the vertices on one side of the surface with the other side. In this case, they're different. If, if we want this to be correct, these two have to be different on different sides of the surface, let's say here. Right, it's very, very similar to just subdividing and then testing that vertex in the middle. Right? In this example, like if we want it to be correct, this vertex, the center one, and this one all have the same, are all on the same side, so to speak. If you discover that this one and this one are on different sides, your assumption in the first place is false. So you have the other case. It's a little bit tricky. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of the summary. Very, very popular, very popular algorithm. It is used in commercial software, it's used in hospitals, it's used all over the world. Very, very popular. And it assumes that you only can have 256 ways in which a surface can pass through a cube. And it reduces, since we, since we know that that's true, so to speak, with the given approximation of the data, the given data resolution we have, we can reduce that to 15 base, but in each case is using symmetry. We have to, we can identify ahead of time the ambiguous cases, by the way, can identify them ahead of time and, and make some tests on those if we discover them. And the maximum number of triangles per cube is, is five in this case. Any questions? So those are some examples of isosurfaces. And I might have some. So that paper, if if you got lost, which I don't, I didn't understand all the steps the first time I heard this. I, I remember learning this myself actually, and I remember my supervisor at the time saying, "Oh yeah, go." He said, "Go implement that algorithm," and I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> And I didn't understand it all at first, that I didn't understand all the steps. So I stressed out, uh, I pulled my hair out and all that stuff. But the best thing to do, one good thing to do is just read the paper. Like, because then you can see it in more detail. And you can read it like slower, and you can repeat things or something. Right, so it, 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 that's, that's a good thing to do. I didn't understand the whole thing until I read it. Paper and it's on Blackboard, by the way. But you don't need to. You don't need Blackboard. You could just you could just Google the the title. And I might have some some little kind of animations of isosurfaces. Right. That's more than one isosurface. That's not just one. Because there's a contour for the skin, and then there's a one for the bone. We've already seen some examples of isosurfaces in, in action in some of the 
the beautiful movies. Oops. <clears throat> Some of the, the movies. Let's see, where is the... Is this one? Okay, that looks very similar. It's very similar. So that's also multiple, multiple surfaces, not just one. So you could add semi-transparency to the surfaces. So that's quite a, a lot of information for one hour. <laughs> Hopefully you're all dead. <laughs> you're all brain dead. And any, any questions before we wrap up? Maybe you have questions next. Happy Commonwealth Day. Happy Monday. <laughs>